In the last episode, you created a web app in Cloud Run backed by a Cloud SQL database. Yes, and it's an app that pulls developers' preferences for tabs or spaces in their code. Everything works, but I'm not sure about how scalable it is. No one is yet. That's why we need to run some load tests. My favorite tool for this is a Python library called Locust.io. Oh, I've heard of that. Uh, let's see, Python 3 and pip. OK, I'm installing it now. Great. Uh, I also sent you another file earlier called locustfile.py. Ah, yep, I have it right here. What does this file do exactly? It creates two types of users, one that views the home page and one that casts votes. And now with the wait attribute, we've told Locust.io to send five times as many homepage views as votes cast. Most apps are pretty read heavy, so I, so I thought that might mimic your user's behavior. Uh, five to one, yeah, that uh, ratio sounds about right. Okay, great. In that case, you can run locust-f locustfile.py to start the process. All righty, starting it. Cool, and the Locust server is now running. So if you click on the link it just printed in your terminal, we'll be ready to start the test. All righty, open that one. Ah, okay, a uh, number of users. Um, I'll start with 50. Uh, spawn rate, what's that? The spawn rate controls how quickly Locust should reach full throttle. So if you enter a value of 10, Locust would reach 50 concurrent users in five seconds. All right, cool. And then for URL, I will grab that from the live URL over here, paste that in. And this is neat. I'm going to release the swarm. Okay, so it's uh, sending data to the app. If I click here on charts, ah, right, here I see the traffic uh, ramping up. Uh, response times, okay, bit of a uh, long response time right there in the beginning, but then it's plateauing out. Uh, pretty good response times, so sub-second response times. It looks like it's holding up pretty well, especially since we deployed this app to Europe and we're running this test from California. Uh, but we should take a peek at how things are running on the server. Let's see here. I'll go into Cloud Run. All right, so I'm scrolling down here, uh, checking out the container memory, memory utilization. Uh, looks like it's at a pretty healthy level. Uh, but of course, Cloud Run is serverless, so it would add more resources if they were needed. So Cloud Run should really always be healthy. Right, and to that point, the real question we're here to answer is how your database is holding up. Ah, okay. Switching to the database in the console now. Going into the pull database. Uh, CPU was very low. Then we created the, the database. So that was took a lot of CPU. Then it was very low here when it did nothing. And then we started the test right around here. It looks like CPU is still pretty low, even though we're putting a lot of load on it. Let's have a look at memory. Uh-huh, memory usage is holding steady around 600 megabytes, and our server has 3.75 gigabytes, so memory is also healthy. And remember, since you're not launched yet, if it shows high CPU or memory, it would be very easy to increase those for your database while there are still no users to care about downtime. Oh, sounds good. Uh, but what if I have launched my app and the database is struggling? What should I do then? I usually follow a four-step plan to ensure that my apps perform well. Oh, I love ordered lists. First, the obvious place to start is optimizing your actual database queries. Things like making sure every column involved in a where clause has an underlying database index, or that frequently run expensive queries like counts are denormalized if possible. That's great to keep in mind. But what should I do if my app is still slow after optimizing all of my queries? It's true that optimization can only get you so far. So the second step is to simply add more CPUs or memory to your database instance. This is often the simplest fix. 
However, even that runs into limits. For example, making your main database larger won't necessarily help an app that performs well in one hemisphere, but poorly in the other. And so my third step is to add read replicas, potentially in different regions if your users are global. Okay, this makes sense so far. And it sounds like these steps would accommodate most applications. Uh, what's the last step? The last step is to introduce partitioning or sharding to your database, but you should never attempt these solutions until you've exhausted all of your simpler options, because these are the most complicated to do correctly. Oh, that list is really helpful. Uh, my users incessantly refresh the page to track which team is winning, tabs or spaces, so I'm optimistic about read replicas. Uh, could we set one up? For sure. To set up a read replica, click on your Cloud SQL instance, and then click on the Replicas tab on the left. All right, Replicas. Yep. Select the Create Read Replica button in the middle. Uh -huh. Very nice. And all of these default values should be good, so you can press Create. All right. Now this will take several minutes to catch up to your production database. Now that your replica is ready, Navigate back to your Cloud Run service and click on the Edit and Deploy a New Revision button. All right, here's my poll service. I'm clicking it. Uh, edit and Deploy a New Version. All right, I'm clicking it. And on that page, select the Connections tab. Connections. Uh, very good. Ah, Cloud SQL connections. Yep, right there. You can press Add Connection and select your new replica. Ah, there is my poll database replica. And once you deploy this, you'll be ready to route your select queries to that replica in your application code as you see fit. Oh, that sounds excellent. Uh, do you have any advice on how to do that, where to route queries? Yes. First and foremost, read replicas can only receive read queries, so select statements. Insert or update queries cannot go to your read replicas. They will fail, and they must go to the primary database. Now, just be aware, if you write to the main database and then immediately try to read those same rows from your replica, you may not get the latest data. And in this situation, you must also send those select queries to your main database. All right, uh, I'll work the read replica into my application code later. Uh, for now, I think I'm ready to launch. Congratulations, your MVP is out the door and now begins the long process of adding new bugs. I mean, features. Maybe you write bugs, Craig, but I prefer not to. Well, if you prefer not adding bugs, then you might want to plan ahead for your eventual changes to your database schema. With a distributed infrastructure like Cloud Run, it's critical to keep database schema updates out of your application startup code. Why is that? Well, some developers run database schema updates like creating new tables or columns as part of their application launch. But for example, let's say the next version of your application needs a country table uh, if this table is created by your framework when it starts, multiple Cloud Run instances could simultaneously detect that the table is missing and attempt to create and populate it. Some of those queries could fail, or you could end up with a country's table full of duplicate records. Oh, I see. Uh, I usually run all of my database schema changes as separate cloud build step when I build my new container. Perfect. That's definitely the right way to handle it. Cool. I feel a lot more confident about pairing Cloud SQL and Cloud Run now. Uh, let's see if I can remember all of the important tips. First, I load test and profile my app to measure performance. As needed, I apply the optimization steps. Second, to avoid conflicts, I make sure that my database schema updates don't run on application startup. That's it. With those steps, Cloud Run and Cloud SQL can be a great pairing, like cheese and wine, or peas and carrots, or dare I say, like tabs and spaces. What? No, you don't mix tabs and spaces. What's wrong with you, Craig? Mm -hmm.